All right, so we're talking about nuclear chemistry in this lecture. And there's a picture showing a nuclear power plant in Richland, Washington. So this is a map of the band of stability just with ships on it and the magical island off in the distance, so it's just for fun. It's also a little bit different. It's got protons this way and neutrons going across this way. But this is what you're more familiar with. So we've been working with this graph. Number of protons, again, versus number of neutrons. So if you had an atom that had 100 protons, how many neutrons would it have in order to be stable? So you'd have to follow it up here, find a spot in the center of the band of stability, and then go across. So I'd say like 155 neutrons for my example. If something falls on the edge, then it's unstable or radioactive. So certain isotopes are more stable than others, meaning they're not going to just start spontaneously decaying. It's really important that you pay attention to the ratio of protons to neutrons when you're talking about stability. You'll notice that it's a one-to-one -one ratio, like 20 protons, 20 neutrons, etc., etc. It kind of follows this line until you start getting into the heavier atoms. Then you need more neutrons for the number of protons that you've got. Example, a small element like magnesium has a one-to-one -one ratio of neutrons and protons, where something heavy like uranium has to have a lot more neutrons for the number of protons that it has. More review. Elements that land on the edge, like I was saying, are radioactive. And usually these are the heavier elements. They have more than 83 protons. So what holds the nucleus together? So there's the strong nuclear force. That's the attractive force. And then there's the pushing away force, the electrostatic force. Protons contribute to both, but protons are more responsible for the repelling force or that electrostatic force. Neutrons are really like the rubber bands that hold the nucleus together. In the video, they were the bungee cords. They are responsible for the strong force, even though they have no charge. You've heard of E equals MC squared. That E really stands for binding energy. That's the energy that's needed to hold the protons and the nucleus together. It's the same energy that's released when an atom is split. During a nuclear reaction, there's actually a change in mass, which seems weird because in a chemical reaction, mass has to be conserved. So what I'm saying is the sum of the parts don't add up to the sum of the whole atom. And that's because some of the energy um, that held these two together was converted from the mass. So this is called mass defect. The whole concept that in nuclear chemistry sometimes the masses don't add up and the mass of the whole atom is less than the masses of the parts. So Einstein is famous of course for this equation. The E, like we were saying, is the binding energy. Mass can actually be converted into energy. How can you form a new element? So this was in the little Island of Stability video that we watched. It's like bowling. You basically bombard a large nucleus with a small nucleus and hope that they stick together and make an even larger nucleus. You have to have it exist long enough to be detected. And you again have to pay attention to that neutron to proton ratio in order to make sure that you've got a stable nucleus. Some isotopes are more stable than others, like I've mentioned before, and the unstable isotopes can undergo nuclear decay. So nuclear chemistry, I love it when definitions are obvious, is really the study of the nucleus of the atom. Again, that's neutrons and protons. We're not paying much attention to electrons. Okay, that's versus a chemical reaction. Um, so in a chemical reaction, the atoms stay the same. You've got four hydrogens to the left of the arrow, four hydrogens to the right, oxygen atoms on the left, oxygen atoms on the right. In a nuclear reaction, you're going to see different elements on the right side of the arrow. 
That's because you're rearranging the protons and neutrons. And again, sometimes those rearrangements can lead to unstable or radioactive elements. Okay, so what is this decaying business? When something is decaying, it's really emitting particles, energy, or both. The atom is falling apart. If your body were like the nucleus of an atom and you were decaying, this is what would happen to you. Stability, of course, is relative. There are some radioactive elements that take thousands or millions of years to decay. Others take fractions of a second to decay. So let's talk about half-life. Half-life is the length of time it takes for half of the atoms in the element to decay, the atoms in your sample. So let's look at radium. Radium's got a half-life of 1,620 years. So if you started with 100 radium atoms, after that many years, 50 would still be radioactive. You'd still have 50 of those radium atoms. The other 50 have decayed into a more stable atom. After another 1,620 years, there would only be 25 radium atoms left. So how long did that take in total years? Well, you would add up 1,620 plus another 1,620. What is that? 3,240 total years. If something has a shorter half-life, that means it's more radioactive. The radioactivity is released faster. So for example, which of these is more radioactive? Carbon-14, which has a half-life of 5,720 years, or radium-226, which has a half-life of 1,620 years? It'd be the radium-226. It's decaying at a faster rate. And it's still a really long rate, which is why they have to bury nuclear waste deep into the earth or in the mountains in the middle of nowhere, or they talk about putting it in the ocean, eastern Washington, different places. Your turn. You've got a sample of 200 radioactive atoms. The half-life is 20 years. After 100 years, how many of your atoms are going to be left? So take a second, pause the video, and see if you can solve this problem. Let's look at it together. You've got 200. After 20 years, there's 100 atoms left. After another 20 years, there's 50. Another 20 years, there's 25. You're up to 60 years. After another 20 years, you only have 12 and a half. And then after, finally, 100 total years, 6.25. But you can't have 0.25 of an atom, so six atoms are left over, six or seven. So let's talk about the usefulness of this. Why would you care about the half-life? Well, it's actually pretty cool because they can actually use carbon dating or uranium dating to figure out how old things are. So if you know the half-life of something, like carbon-14 has a half-life of 5,730 years, you can look at something that maybe you've dug up some old bones and you can look at the ratio of carbon-14 to the atoms that it decays into and you can figure out how long that thing has been around because once something has died, it's not getting new carbon atoms. So it has what it had when it, when it died. Um, Uranium is used for things like You've heard about when they find fossils in different layers of the earth. They can study the uranium uh, in those areas, and because its half-life is 4.5 billion years, it's used to date much older rocks. And this is just kind of a picture portraying that. They call the starting atoms the parents, and what they're decaying into the daughters. And so this was just a silly illustration that somebody made online. They've got the parent, she's being cut in half, while the daughter is growing larger and appearing. Creepy looking daughter there. So there's three main types of radiation. There's alpha, beta, and gamma. And it is important that you know the difference between these and actually uh, be able to explain what happens to the nucleus with each type of radiation. So let's start with alpha. When alpha radiation happens, a chunk the size of a helium nucleus 
comes off of the nucleus that you're discussing that's undergoing alpha decay. And this particle has a positive charge because it's two protons and two neutrons. And we're going to look at some examples of how to do these nuclear equations as well. Alpha particles, by the way, are so large they can't penetrate very far into matter. They can actually be shielded with a piece of paper. Beta decay is a little bit weird, um, which we're going to get to in a second. Some interesting facts, they used to sell something called Tho Radia face cream. And it was uh, in the 1930s, it was in a bunch of beauty products and perfumes. Um, the face cream contained 0.5 grams of thorium chloride and 0.25 milligrams of radium bromide. Um, and it obviously was not good for your face. People also drank radium water. It was said to cure stomach cancer and mental illness. It was advertised as perpetual sunshine. It gained uh, some notoriety though when even Byers, an American industrialist, drank a bottle a day for four years and then he died in excruciating pain as cancer of the jaw caused his facial bones to disintegrate. So radioactive water, not so good. They also used to sell toy atomic energy labs to kids, parents and kids, and then up until the late 1970s. It actually had real uranium ore in it. So low levels of radioactive material, but still you wouldn't find parents today wanting their kids to play with it. They also used to sell radium chocolate in the 1930s. It was advertised for its powers of rejuvenation. So beta decay is really different from alpha decay. Beta decay um, has a negative charge. The particle that's emitted is called a high energy electron. And when this electron is emitted, a neutron is converted into a proton. And I like to explain it to people by thinking of a neutron as having both a proton and an electron within it. And that's why it's neutral. It's not exactly how it is, but when, when that electron is emitted, that neutron now just has that positive charge and so it's a proton and the mass hasn't changed. Beta particles are also too big to penetrate you um, and they can be stopped with aluminum foil. Gamma radiation is the third type and gamma radiation often comes with an alpha or a beta decay. It's a very high energy um, wave and it doesn't have any mass or charge they can penetrate um, you, your skin, but they can be stopped with lead, like x-rays. And then here's a little Spider-Man uh, comic, accidentally ascribing a fantastic amount, uh, oh, uh, absorbing a fantastic amount of radioactivity, the dying insect in sudden shock bites the nearest living thing at the split second before life ebbs from its radioactive body. Ow! A spider, it bit me, but why is it burning so? Why is it glowing in that way? Uh-oh. So, in alpha decay, just to review, the atomic number changes. It goes down by four because it's emitting that alpha particle. The number of protons goes down by two, and the number of neutrons also goes down by two. So now it's your turn to do a problem. You're supposed to write, if you're follow, following along with your fill in the blank notes, the alpha decay for the example. So pause the video here and try and see if you can write out the products. Okay, so we're gonna start if you've got a polonium 210 atom and it undergoes alpha decay because it has 84 protons. Once it loses that chunk of two protons and two neutrons, it's now going to be 84 minus 2, it's going to be number 82. So if you look up on the periodic table, number 82 is lead. And the mass went down from 210 to 206 because again, you since you lost two protons and two neutrons, you need to subtract 4. So if you added these two back together, they would remake the polonium. But that's not what decay is. Decay is coming apart. How about a beta decay? Here's an example. The atomic number stays the same. 
This carbon atom is undergoing beta decay because the mass stayed the same, but a neutron was converted into a proton, and so now it changed into element number seven, which is nitrogen. And this is how you write the beta particle, or sometimes you'll see a fancy B written right here. Okay, so now it's turn, your turn to, um, I think it's silicon 14. Practice writing what would happen if that, or silicon 27, what would happen if that underwent beta decay. So pause the video here and take a second and figure out what the products are. Okay, silicon 27, it's number 14. If it undergoes beta decay, the mass will still stay at 27 but the 14 changes into a 15, which is the element phosphorus. More practice. Pause the video, see if you can do these on your own. Francium-221 undergoes an alpha decay. Here's the alpha particle. 221 minus 4 is 217. 87 minus 2 is number 85, AT astatine. Thorium-234 undergoing a beta decay. It's number 90, so it's going to change into number 91. And the mass will stay the same. And number 91 symbol is Pa. Sometimes the road to stability is long. Check this out. This is an actual decay chain for uranium-238. This is what happens. Uranium-238 undergoes alpha decay, and then a beta, and then another beta, and then another, an alpha, an alpha, an alpha, an alpha, an alpha, and then a beta, a beta, an alpha, a beta, a beta, an alpha. And this is how long it takes, the, or how long it takes for half of the amount of atoms to decay. A lot of decay chains end with lead. Lead is very stable. There are unstable lead isotopes, which are intermediates along the way, like lead-214, lead-210, but ultimately lead-206 is stable. That's something we did in class. All right, what are some uses for radioactive elements? There's nuclear medicine. We've read the Vicky's uh, isotopes reading in class, so we know a little bit about that. There's nuclear power, and then we're also going to discuss atomic weapons. Okay, first, um, you probably know someone who's undergone radiation therapy. So radiation is used to treat cancer. But yes, too much, just like you might have heard about, can actually cause cancer. So what happens when radiation is being used as a therapy is that radiation beams knock electrons off of the atoms that are making up the DNA chains and they turn them into free radicals, so they basically damage them. So the bad cells won't replicate anymore, the tumor cells. And there are lots of different radioactive elements that are used and radioactive isotopes like polonium, cobalt, cesium, and radium. Let's talk about nuclear power. If you split an atom, that's called fission. Someone said they remember the difference between fission and fusion because fission has two S's and so you could like slice between them. Scissors also has two S's. So fission is cutting. So a lot of times when fission happens, um, you're splitting something really heavy like a uranium atom. These products are radioactive. When you split a nucleus into smaller fragments, you're releasing a ton of energy. You're also releasing more neutrons, which then split more atoms that are nearby. Nuclear power plants and most nuclear weapons rely on this fission process. Fusion is just the opposite. It's when two or more light nuclei are combined. The products are not radioactive, although this requires extremely high temperatures for fusion to occur like that of the sun and the stars. So usually a fission reaction is required to get fusion to happen. Both of these types of uh, reactions release large amounts of energy, fission and fusion. So just like I was saying before, when you split atoms, some of these smaller particles split other atoms and so on and so on, and it's a, called a chain reaction. 
This is a picture of the sun, and the sun is actually fusing hydrogen atoms and making helium atoms. So in fusion, like I was saying, two nuclei combine, and this releases very large amounts of energy, but requires very high temperatures. At these high temperatures, nuclei are moving so fast that collisions between them can overcome the natural repulsion of their positive charges. What about nuclear power plants? How do they work? They operate with fission in mind. So atoms are being split. This releases heat. The heat is used to heat up water, which makes steam. Steam spins a turbine, which ultimately causes the copper in a generator to spin between the magnets, and that is moving electrons, electricity. What about atomic weapons? Nuclear weapons derive their destructive force from fusion or fission. How many have there been? Two nuclear weapons have been detonated. Both were by the United States at the end of World War II. The first atomic bomb ever dropped uh, in a war situation was on Hiroshima, and then the second was on Nagasaki. Um, Hir Hiroshima or Hiroshima was the that atomic bomb was dropped on August 6, 1945. It was made of uranium. 140,000 people were killed instantly or from illness associated with the radiation. Nagasaki was a few days later. That was a plutonium bomb. 80,000 people were killed either instantly or from illness associated with the radiation. Let's back up. How did they even make an atomic bomb? Well, they had a sneaky suspicion that Hitler was trying to make one in Germany. And so a group of scientists was secretly formed, uh, and they called it the Manhattan Project. This was basically a secret name to develop the first nuclear weapon. Robert Oppenheimer was uh, the scientific researcher that was put in charge of the entire product, project. He was known as the father of the atomic bomb. Phew. The Trinity test was actually done before the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. It was the first detonation of a nuclear bomb, and that was in 1945 in New Mexico. So the two main types of nuclear weapons, there's the atomic bombs, and there are different assembly methods uh, within fission bombs. There's the gun type assembly, and there's also an implosion type assembly. And there's fusion bombs, or hydrogen bombs. Hydrogen bombs use the energy of a fission bomb to heat the fusion fuel. They are over a thousand times more powerful than a fission bomb. They have not used one of those in war. Only six countries in this, uh, to, up to this date have detonated one. What about nuclear fallout? You might have heard of this. This is the residual radiation hazard from a nuclear explosion. It's called the fallout because it falls out of the atmosphere and spread during the explosion. Let's talk about how elements are made in the stars because this is related to fusion. Okay, so when you've got cool stars, those are relative because um, they're still very hot. Like the sun, is fusing hydrogen atoms into helium. Bigger and hotter stars fuse slightly heavier elements up to iron. Supernovas create all the way up through element number 92, which is helium, or, uh, sorry, uranium. So this is called nucleosynthesis. This is what we're talking about. So these are like addition questions. A beryllium plus a helium makes a carbon. So this is the opposite of a decay when you see the plus sign on the left of the arrow. Elements heavier than iron are believed to be made by something called neutron capture. 
This is a two-step process. First, a neutron collides and fuses with the nucleus of an atom, and then it's overloaded with neutrons, so it undergoes the beta decay. A neutron changes into a proton. And that is it for the nuclear chemistry lecture.